the two researchers uh, who we're going to be welcoming to the stage shortly um, both represent in very different ways um, the cutting edge of what's possible today. And we're particularly proud that we're able to present uh, research which is happening right here in Singapore. So our first speaker um, is the director of the Institute um, for Media at the Nanyang Technological um, uh, University of Singapore. Um, her name is Professor Nadia Talman, and she has a 30-year career of working um, within robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, she began her career working with avatars, with virtual uh, intelligence, and how to embody um, the kind of the lifelike nature um, of what it means to be human within the virtual space. But in recent years, she's, um, she's evolved into somebody who's uh, embodying those virtual intelligences within mechanical bodies. And she's the author of uh, the world's most um, realistic female humanoid um, called Nadine. Um, Nadine is one of the centerpieces of the Human Plus exhibition, and if you haven't already met her, you're in for a quite uncanny encounter at the end of Human Plus. Um, she's certainly kind of worth the entrance ticket alone to have a conversation with. Um, Nadia Talman herself has a glittering career working within um, computer science and artificial intelligence, as well as running um, her lab here at NTU in Singapore. She also has an a, um, a lab in, in Switzerland. So we're extremely excited that she's with us today. So please welcome to the stage, Professor Nadia Talman. So good afternoon, everybody. This is my pleasure to be here. I hope everybody has already spoken to Nadine. If not, uh, please visit B2 uh, place here, and you will have the pleasure to freely interact with her as it is the first time she's off uh, academic uh, walls. So as you can see here, and it was said uh, by, you know, I'm from two places, in fact. I have a lab in Geneva and I have Singapore. You see, I put this beautiful photo of the museum where we are. And in two places, I do a bit different things. Here, I work more on robotics. Also, I, ha I have started robotics in my lab in Geneva since 10 years as I was working on a robot, Eva. In fact, Eva was a very realistic head. Actually, she's playing in a... Um, theater in Zurich, and she's speaking uh, Schweizerdeutsch. So if you are interested, you can just look on Mirhalab website. You will see uh, her in the theater in Zurich. So she plays the role of an actor. So this is Eva, and now Nadine here in Singapore. So as said, all over humanities, and we have seen with the last speaker, people have dreamt of automaton superhero, realistic uh, coach, or whatever, it is now the time that they are, in fact, concretely coming, like Nadine Robot. So just an idea here, even the Greek was saying that they were inventing some automaton to defend the island of Crete, so from enemies. So in some way, they describe completely this Talos, and they have quite a lot of others, and this is quite interesting to see that is something very deep in ourselves. We have dreamt of having automaton, and we start to have them if you look at Nadine, because it's a tangible one, not just only uh, fiction. So if we look just back in the centuries, you see that even in the Middle Age, or short after the Middle Age with Leonardo da Vinci, he made an automaton, like a knight, that was able to bow uh, in front of the VIPs. So you see, already at that time, mechanically, he was able, tangible, to make a knight and other things. If you have seen Leonardo exhibition, you can see quite a lot of things about him. And so he has concretely started to do this automatic uh, automaton, like this one. And if you visit Europe, like England, Germany, or Switzerland, you will see 
uh, at the end of the last 19th century, 20th, there were a lot of people working in physics and trying to, to make automaton like this one who is able to write automatically or others who are able to sing. So they are marvel of beauty, but doing, of course, always the same because at that time it didn't exist the programming we didn't have. So programming allows to be more flexible in all tasks. Here it was dedicated, but if you have the chance, try to see this marvel of history in terms of automaton. So, of course, myself, I have studied psychology as first degree. My PhD is in quantum physics, and now I do robotics. So I'm pretty interdisciplinary. This is to say that, in fact, when you look here, you can see that computers today are really interactive. Of course, when you see a computer like that, it's like mine, we would like to have more an embodied shape. But it's still like a kind of very limited robot because no other, other actions that to be able to interact. But still, we interact a lot and it creates a lot of data. And thanks to this lot of data, the computer, we can write programs and the programs can uh, generate new information or prediction. This is what we name deep learning methods. So this is what we do, for example, also for Nadine. Now, before I speak a bit of Nadine, I would like to speak about a general pro program and also a problem in society. Uh, why we need robots, because a lot of people are asking me why you do robots, concrete robots, when it is imagination, is great for entertainment, but why do we need them? And you know, we have serious problems in terms, for example, of loneliness. A lot of young people, hopefully not among you, you are already here, so certainly not, but some of them feel lonely, some others, elderly particularly, are also uh, lonely, particularly those who are with Alzheimer and dementia, and this is very complicated to find people to take care of them. And this curve, this diagram is very important. You can see that in, uh, if we look on this diagram, in 1950, we had many more children aged less than five years than elderly. And you see that these two curves will change over 2020. They will completely be inverted. So the more we go, and in any country, even in undeveloped or developing country, uh, or low cost, low uh, income country, we see that in fact, these people uh, will have problem with the elderly. So who will take care of them? This is a big question. So that's the reason why, why not social robots? So social robots, what is the difference with a robot? Is able to deal with social clues, you know, and social rules in society. So when we develop social robots, we need to work with psychologists, sociologists, in order that the robot fits every situation. So Nadine is a new one that takes care of these social skills. Okay, so what is it? Uh, you can see concretely that she is, uh, in fact, uh, one, she can say, say herself, she is one meter 31. In fact, she said she's one meter 40. She likes to be bigger, uh, taller, and also her weight is 35 kilos. So for robots, the less they are uh, heavy, the best it is in terms of simulating their motion. Now, how can she move? In fact, you will see she has, she's linked to an uh, air compressor, and in fact, she has air motors. And with the uh, air motors, she's able to be inflated each time the program asks to do something, or you interact like with a computer with her, then her, let's say, motors simulate the actuators with airs. So it's how she's working. The good point of that is Nadine does not do any noise because many robots with electricity do noise. So when you have interaction, you just like not to hear when they move the arms because they are real life robots. Okay, so just to tell you not to give a course, but just tell you what are the challenges in the real life to do robots. So you know robots, they don't have natural senses. 
and they can't see. They see only with cameras. So, and also, uh, in computer science, what we understand is always, let's say, pixel based on zero and one. So all that is the, let's say, basic that a robot will tackle the world. So everything should be transcoded into this kind of information. So in fact, the big research we do actually is that Nadine is aware who is around her and recognize, but not only recognize the person, what is this person doing? Is she holding something? Is she sad? Uh, and how people interact between each other? So you see the, the research is pretty much endless and we are working in the Institute for Media Innovation in NTU on all that. So what is complicated, for example, is to have Nadine in a group and everybody talks and Nadine takes the word. But when does she speak? When can she say something? You know, it's quite a lot of research to detect who speaks, what she should say, who are the, the, the ambience around, to pay attention to everybody, the social rules, etc. So you understand, is a research for many years. Okay, so I just show you what you don't, you could try with Nadine, so that's no problem. But uh, James, who is the PhD student, uh, has tried with Nadine to tell her, for example, bad things. And uh, she will, Nadine can, is set up actually on very good uh, mood and personality, but she could be set up upon a bad personality or neurotic. Then in this case, she will answer everybody in a bad way. So you understand, we put her here on a positive way in order people enjoy, but we could change it and she could be very, uh, not uh, so nice because we use psychological models that have been quantified in order we can put values for personality, mood and emotion. So I just show you an example of James interacting with Nadine. Can we put the sound? Sorry, that's the sound. Sorry. But you look ugly today. Do not say so. We are good friends. Sorry. Your words sound sleepy. Do not fool me. You are so boring. Ah, oh. sorry. I don't like to talk with you. Hmm. I am sorry for that. I hope you can change your mind. You are so mean. What is wrong with you today? I don't like to go with you. Let us stop. Shall we go swimming? Something without you. Goodbye. You do not have to come back. So just to say that I see the first days here, people who came, they were always speaking nicely to Nadine. Now you have seen that you can try other kind of discussion. So I just like to tell you that as Nadine has a lot of novelties, it was presented in many places. Yeah. So you can see. I think the world was astonished to see a robot that has, a, let's say, simulation of emotion, no real ones, but simulation. And of course, memory. So, for example, Nadine knows me, and when I discuss with her, she remembers what I have told her, and we can discuss about facts. So this is quite interesting. It's a quite complex robot. In fact, when people go downstairs, they mostly chat with her. So we can do louder. My name is Nadine. How old are you now? I look 30, but I'm only three years old. That's great. Thanks, friend. Hi, Nadine. Hi, how are you? Nadine is a name. You are beautiful. Thank you. 
you friend. I think you look attractive too. Do you like me? Yes, I love everybody. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you too. Hello, Nadine. Do you know who's the president of Singapore? Tony Tan is the president. Who's the Prime Minister of Singapore? Lee Shen Long is the Prime Minister. Who's the President of NTU? Bertie Landerson. So she has Bye. enough, she stopped. <laughs> Okay, so just to tell you a bit what we are doing this month, uh, when you are in the exhibition, there is Nadine, but Nadine will change over time. That means not her appearance, of course, but what is complicated to develop is all the functionalities. So what we are doing, so you see also uh, in this image how the, the skeleton of Nadine is in reality. And what we are working, and you can see in the next room to Nadine, that people, researchers from our institute will show how we make, build a hand. For example, you know that humans have 50% of their articulations in their hands, so that's very important to build natural human hands. And Nadine, uh, what we do is building a hand using 3D printing, and then because it's lighter and faster. And the second thing, is with this technology, we are also working on recognition object and person and attitudes uh, for Nadine. So when the visitors will come in a couple of months, uh, surely they will be able to play a game because Nadine will recognize uh, who is taking what and she will be able to take everything like a, a real human does. So this is the top of our research today being more aware and being able to grasp things like a human does. Let's have a look at this ongoing development. You can see uh, in the museum, we have the people working every day. Okay, so just to show what Nadine could do in the next future, as I said, it's impossible to have 24 hours someone for elderly who have difficulties, particularly in, in Singapore and many other countries, people are aging, so we'll need more support. So there are some activity in the future for Nadine kind of robots. And to finish my presentation, I just like to show you Nadine singing, because quite a lot of visitors who already came ask, can Nadine sing? Yes, she can, but the problem is my former robot, Eva, I brought her in Switzerland in a shopping center, and then people could choose the song they like. And she sang so much that all her skin spread out. So you see, I'm afraid for Nadine, so I didn't allow her to sing. So when she is asked, can you sing, she said, no, I, I cannot, yeah, because it's too complicated. So here you will see we have done a nice montage, because the idea, we had a, a party downtown Singapore to celebrate any year uh, season. And then as we could not move Nadine easily, 
she stayed where she was and we make some 3D virtual environments behind her and we let her sing a song from Adil. So let's finish my presentation with Nadine singing. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Wow. How many of you knew that Singapore was such an incredible site of innovation and kind of robotics excellence? Hands up. Just a few. I think all of these people work at NTU. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Nadia, for that fantastic presentation. Um, greatly appreciated. So we're going to move now to the third presentation of, um, of today. And um, we're extremely fortunate to be joined by another robotics researcher based in Singapore at NTU, Nanyang Technological University. Um, Louis-Philippe Demars. Um, like um, Professor Nadia, he's a key part of the Human Plus exhibition. Um, but his take on robotics is slightly different. Um, and as he's setting up, um, I can just tell a little anecdote. So in many ways, Louis-Philippe is the, the reason why I'm in Singapore. Um, so Louis-Philippe and I were um, on the same PhD cohort um, many years ago. And, uh, which was from the University of, of Zurich in Switzerland. And as his uh, role at NTU in 2008, he invited our cohort to NTU to do a, a research residency there. And that was kind of where I sort of fell in love with Singapore. And many years later, when I was invited to join the Art Science Museum, that was one of the reasons why I felt, you know, kind of so happy about joining. So he, he bears a lot of credit for me being here. Um, his practice has been influenced by um, a, a kind of a deep knowledge of, of theatre, of opera, of dance, um, and of the performing arts. And many of Louis Philippe's robots, which he's developed over a 20-year career, have been um, contextualised within the context of performance. Um, his research has... Um, as a roboticist, often looks at the psychology of how humans um, perceive and interact with robots. Um, and that's at the center of a lot of his work at NTU. Um, so to contextualize the piece that he's presenting downstairs and to talk about his work in general, please welcome Louis-Philippe de Maas. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, Thanks for being here and thanks for the museum to have me to present and exhibit the piece. Uh, I've, it's the third declination of Human Plus, I think, and, and it, this is like uh, kind of the biggest one and it's great it and it's evolving through time, so it's introducing like new artwork, local artwork and so forth, so congratulations. So um, I just wanted to reflect a bit on Human Plus and to think about uh, things that are really hyped these days, like artificial intelligence. Um, this is the, the original text of when people derive AI in 1956. Uh, it, it's actually rather pompous. Uh, and they say we can basically model everything and we're going to throw a bunch of students over a few semesters or summer and then we're going to solve it. 
So the, the idea is if you think about AI, you have to, if you, let's say, think about the brave new world of AI, you have to think that everything can be modeled, everything could be either simulated, reproduced, and so forth. And that's one thing that Human Plus does. It challenges the question about what is reproduction, what's the limit, of what's alive, what's intelligent, and so forth. So downstairs, sorry, um, you have a version of Area V5. At the time when I made this, um, it was a comment on the uncanny, a comment on AI, a comment on social robots. Um, because the, these eyes are basically staring at you. And I tried to make it as disagreeable as possible. So take skulls. Um, actually, these are based on Mexican skull racks, the trompanzil. Like this is what they do to scare people when to get into the village. And just have a whole sheer quantity. And actually, when I did psychological testing, people are entertained. They don't bother about these things anymore. So, but the idea about the gaze is when a, when a robot looks at you or piece of mechanics look at you, is he actually sensing you, recognizing you? This is all like fake model, and this is where theater and all these parts kicks in as pretty much everything that's around us is invented. And to start thinking about robots, we have to start thinking about what is the meaning of a body, what is a body, and what are all the layers of a body, which is way more than just assembling a bits of nuts and bolts. So um, I'm trying to make a copy of myself, but I still very early stage, uh, and I just left it. It was too complicated. Um, and then if you look at it downstairs, actually like this is uh, MRI of somebody who's about to go for brain surgery and this is actually the skulls downstairs they made for this so if you want to recognize why they're there. they all skulls as well because uh, this morning people talk about Descartes. Descartes t t was a proponent of saying the intelligence is in the brain, this is the center sacrosanct repository of all the pure thoughts but in reality we, are, we really realize it's not the case. So to show a bit where Area V5 goes in the rest of all the works is just to show you a bit of things that have been bouncing around, going maybe from a mechanistic point of view at the beginning to a more and more, let's say, experiential point of view. So these days I'm more interested in having interaction, but let's say radical one, I would say get people to interact with robot directly, just put machines on performers. You'll see Stellar downstairs examples. What it gives when we change the anatomy of the body and what happens when we enslave bodies as performers. And this is a piece called Inferno where actually we get the public to perform for other people of public. And I will be talking a bit more about this, but I'm just gonna show a little trailer before getting into the little more academic part of the presentation. things coming from. Um, Jessica Riskin pointed out very, um, like, um, quite obvious that there's a part of us that we think everything can be modeled, like we say AI, but there's a part of us which we really refuse that things could be, like, synthesized, could be remade. Like, we, there's something about us saying, like, no, 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 it's not possible. And the idea is, like, a robot is always, or a machine is always walking that thin line and through time it's been evolving and changing. Actually, it always l described the actual epistemology of what we understand about the human body of a given period. And just to show you about reproduction, of course, our text is based on the uh, le canard de girateur, like the, the duck that could 
um, eat food. So that's a performance uh, made in the 18th century. And actually, during the performance, the duck is eating food and generating excrement at the end. So the big question of the people at that time saying, is this real, is this fake, and so forth. So it's a big question. It's quite interesting that you know, it's based on a very, very low level function of the human body, and not the very, but it triggered a lot of intelligence yeah, to deal with this. So the work I've been doing at the beginning was more at that level, so I just did a lot of robots that were more building parts of elements and try to create societies out of this. Less going from one part which is more mechanistic to now to the experience. So I shifted more, let's say, from what is a robot to how to experience a robot. So I'm less and less interested. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I have to build those. But at the end, this is the last part that I'm interested in. So. When we make a body of a robot, and it was presented a bit this morning, and Nadia touched base on this, it's like if you took, if you look at the Western body in like true time, it's always fitting what we represent. Going from the Greek time is like, for instance, uh, let's say early performance of robots are made 2,000 years ago, um, and they're writing um, little machines from the Swiss, and they were actually writing, "We are the androids." This is like not uh, Terminator 2, this is 18th century. And actually when they made this, they, were, they made this to laugh at the cat. And it was written as well, I think therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum, just to think about all these things. But, and then now these days, this is where we're standing at. Of course, you have the Gemini replication, Nadine is part of the same generation. But then when it gets really uncanny, like uh, Hansen, uh, the disembodied head, but this is Area V5 as well. This is actually like a replication of his girlfriend. Um, I'll leave you to think whatever you think about it. But up there for me is, uh, this is a Price Electronica Award Prize. Up there is called The Helpless Robot by Norman White. This is a robot that does nothing. It's just a box on wheels that asks you to do things for the robot. So it will say, like, can you move me there? Can you do this? Can you do that? So basically, you become the agent to move the robot around. So in this case, where is the intelligence? How does it work? So like the, um, the situation is like the context creates the intelligence and the environment and so forth. And if we go to recent times, uh, William Delvaux, Cloaca, uh, he actually made large-scale version of human digestive system. So just to show that 300 years later, like we actually build a machine and they can look and analyze the thing and say, okay, this is human excrement. So we uh, feed the machine and so forth. So, yeah. But the, the thing that interests me with a robot is not to look necessarily as a robot as a copy of herself, but it's a mirror. It's an interesting mirror, but... Maybe it's a way to experiment it and experiment alternative morphologies, alternative scenarios. But at the end, it's something that we build and it's always a strange mirror that comes and reflects on you. But to understand a robot, you have to understand our perception and a lot of it is based on who we are and this is why the body becomes really important. So, um, and behavior as well. Just a very simple psychological element. On this side, if you have different motion of a robot, let's say the first one jumps, and the one underneath jumps as well. The first has a reason to jump, there's an obstacle. The second one, maybe he's happy, maybe it's a bug in the program, whatsoever. So the observation is the same, the context is a bit different, the intelligence hasn't changed, and so forth. And on the other side here, I'll just play this. What is this thing? Hard to tell, huh? And this one? Okay, so maybe if you put your hand up, your head upside down, I'll play it again. You see it more? Is somebody walking? What does that tell you? 
you're perceiving the world standing on your feet. So from paintings that have the horizon to everything, I think I am and I exist standing on my feet. So try to imagine the world if you only want to have one hand or no hands. There's no more left and right concept. So like, the body is supremely important and our perception of everything is really important. So you cannot differentiate your perception of the environment, the context, and all these different layers when you start looking at a robot and a body. So like Mark Johnson said in this example, there are many, many layers of bodies coming from the very, very low level biological or more functional, more mechanistic, and you go up and up to something very high level. So for instance, sex is defined at a biological level, but genders is defined at a cultural level. So when you start looking at robots, uh, you have to mix all this thing together. So you cannot look at a robot saying like, uh, this robot is performing well because you can walk up the stairs. Uh, you have to say, why is it walking up the stair? How is it walking up the stairs and so forth? And what's the context? And of course, these days, uh, replication is very important. So I will have to have, have, have Nadine in these ones. So like a lot of people are interested in always have these strange mirrors. But what interests me most is the role of the body in the R AI and artificial intelligence. So the people have been dealing a lot with these elements from AI, modern AI is all about your brain, your way you perceive the world depends on your body. And the next two one is basically like they explain where mathematics come from, from bodily perspective. Very, very high level percept, complex things that seems very abstract are really based on your bodily function or your, your feedback, your perception of yourself in the environment. So this is something to really consider is like your body is much more than just a vehicle. This is the location of your understanding of the world through yourself. So let's show you examples of embodiment and intelligence. I'll show you two robots walking. This is my classic. So one on this side is called Denise. And of course, you all recognize Azimo from Honda. So which one has a bit more of mojo when he walks? Which one is natural or not speaking of natural, but which one looks like he's walking interestingly? The one on the right. Um, the thing that is to be noticed, this thing on the right has no computer, is just a self-balancing balancing act. Actually, when you walk, your brain does almost nothing. It's all in your body. Actually, the brain only controls, they say, swing the leg forward. That's all it does. The rest is disembodied. And of course, this thing thinks too much. It's full of motors, and everything is too modeled. So the, the thing is, like, I'm more, yeah, I always let it run. And that's the thing. The object doesn't know how to fall. It's rigid. So there's no concept of this, plus everything is, if you think about a robot, if you have to think at every little details, if I would be walking, imagine if I would think about every movement of my muscle, it would be impossible. I would be busy only doing this. So things have to be decentralized and intelligence is where? Like, you know, like in, in your toes or is it in your tendon or is it in your brain? So this is like something that we start mixing a lot. So if I go back to AI, I'm more interested in having little robots that behave. This is made with rubber band. This is like a, a research done at the ETH and the University of Zurich. And this is Stumpy. So this is a robot that they made to study locomotion. This robot has no intelligence. And the way it moves, when you look at it, of course, it has a, a bit of a, of course, a cute factor. But to understand this robot, I can always 
tell you one thing is like try to walk without bending your knees. What would you do? You would walk like this. You would walk like a penguin. So the idea is like um, as soon as you understood this part, you, your body came out, you understand your body, you could project it on the robot. And this is why I used this robot in a dance performance to do it. But before going to this, I can show you a few of these ones here. Uh, they are all different behaving robots, but all of them are controlled only with a motor spinning. So you have three major different behaviors. So let's say if you're a neurosurgeon or a brain surgeon, you put MRI or you put all the analysis, you will get the same brain activity. There you go. So three different behaviors, so that doesn't explain everything. So uh, speaking of misbehaving, so these are these little stumpy robots in performance. In this case, um, just before, uh, maybe I'll jump if I can. This piece was called the Tiller Girls, and it's based on this group. So basically, what I did is I borrowed intelligence from the name of the Tiller Girls, and I put it on the robots. The robots don't know how to dance, but when you associate the two, you see this as dancing. And I even measured this psychologically. Like when I introduce the word to the people, the people go, oh, they dance. One robot by itself, they go, oh, it's moving. Two robots, they say, oh, it's dancing. So I made all kind of little experiments to see where is the intelligence emerging or the perceived intelligence. So another form of intelligence is what we think that is happening, and this is a lot of hoax. Uh, Underneath there, this is the chess player, classic example of a borrowed intelligence. Borrowed intelligence is a word that Tesla used when he made his uh, wireless submarine. So he was a big showman and he was showing like remote controlled objects at that time, it was not seen. So people say, how does it work? Or instead of saying like it's artificial intelligence, he said, no, it's borrowed intelligence because I'm doing it. And a lot of robots would dealing with our borrowed intelligence, they're not artificial intelligence. So, and this is what I did with borrowed intelligence. It's actually a robot that touches you. You sit in the front and the robot just recalls what, what we think a stereotype of a blind person does. I get to be touched by the blind robot, which is the reverse situation of what happens in hospital. They measure this because in hospital you don't want to be touched. If somebody washes you, you want to be touched more clinically. But when somebody says you, you're gonna die from cancer, you want to be hugged. So there's different context to, to explain all these things. But what's important in here, the intelligence of the robot lies only, or the expertise of the robot lies only in its name. That's very, very important. And if I change the name, people, they don't see the intention. If you go back to the one at the beginning, the jumping thing, you don't know why the robot is doing this. And as well, if you go back to the little writing machine, if they use child, that was made on purpose because a child is permissive. If he makes a mistake, he will accept it. If it's otherwise, it should be a virtuoso. So maybe I'll leave you on this one. So my 20 minutes over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would invite uh, Michael and Nadia to come here on the stage and uh, let's open the discussion and the conversation
about robot cyborgs and uh, all these issues. Um, are there already questions from the audience? Yes, there is one over there. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. It's really great. My name is Lynn. I'm from Euronius College. So I kind of have two quick questions. Uh, one is, um, so we're trying to build like a social robot, but we don't quite even understand how ourselves process social information in terms of like social cognition. How do we understand people's intentions, beliefs, thoughts, attitudes, disposition? So how can we then build a robot that does that? And then the second question is, um, what um, do all of you see the role of robots in society? Like, what is the role of robot in society? Because depending on what we think its role is, it's how we would build them in a different way. Um, and, like, what do you think about her whole... So Bill Gates said that robots, if they replace human labor, should pay taxes. So it's kind of a fun question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, you want to start? Uh, no? no? At least uh, the first question, how can we summarize? <laughs> anyway, what, what for the second question, what I can answer is, in fact, robots are created in order to serve us, in order to coach us, to help us. So we will do with them what we like them to do for us. And I think society has truly a real need of robots, as I explained in my presentation for, for example, dementia or all these people who today still spend hours alone and finally die in their loneliness. But there are, as said, quite a lot of attitude or we need coach, you know, for exercising, to eat less, to have somebody to train us to do exercise, not to smoke or not to drink. I mean, if we look at society with all the problems we face, maybe it's nice to have a companion that can analyze our style and eventually help us to come out on a daily minute basis if we need so to have a coach. So I think they are very necessary in each segment where we need people. So that's the reason why so many people are trying to build, uh, let's say, robots who are aware of the environment. The robot that he showed before with Professor Ushiguro, it was very fancy because I went some time ago to visit, uh, many years ago. And, you know, I discussed with the robot and I was so astonished that the robot recognized me and I thought in terms of research it's totally impossible. And in fact, suddenly a guy came out so many of these robots has still somebody behind that hear and control all what is being done and there is a human behind. So the great difficulties we face is to have smart robots that can understand that, for example, if I would be Nadine and Nadine is not able to do this and no robot in the world is able to do it, is that uh, let's say Nadine is unable to understand that she's in this ra room in the museum and so many people are looking and, and listening and so on. So the awareness, how can we capture the information and interpret it and afterwards take a decision to have the right attitude at the right moment. I'm seeing a lot of people are working on that in the community. So I think I have mainly answered the second question. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, um, Louis Philippe, do, do you want also to uh, elaborate on why to build robots? Because sometimes maybe robots are built without a function, and then the function comes uh, comes after. Yeah, I mean, um, well, yeah. Um, as well, it depends where do you define what a robot is. You you know, like, is it a tool? Is it a companion? Whatever it is, because we. We have tools with us. We are tool makers, like as animals. So, um, so we, we're surrounded by things that extend us or help us to achieve a task. Or 
But when it comes to the social robot, of course, depending on who you're going to ask, you're going to get a very different answer. You know, there are people who will like to have their robots play soccer, and then the other people will like to have companions. Uh, I would have to have entertainment. Um, and a lot of people have pets, you know, like, like the question is like, you know, you can say, okay, do, do you have pets? So maybe, you know, they are your own little invented uh, servant. They just organic, you know, like we can go into domestication as a horrifying aspect of, you know, what is done to, to these elements. Uh, but th the point is, is a lot of time, like if you just step back there, are a lot of different school of thought. Some people think that if we make social robot, it enable us to understand human societies. That's a, that's a stance. So if they create an object that people interact with, they think that they can have some results, research results out of this. So that's one position. And from the art side, with, which is actually like, uh, because we're lazy, we can just put something out there and say, how oh, deal with it. <laughs> and, and, this, and because you just want to provoke the discussion, this is more uh, why it's important. Because behind every human, it, it, we, are, we are very mechanical, very repetitive. The society is very mechanistic, but a robot is very human as well at the same time. So like the, it's paradox as well. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, this morning we talked about, like Oren talked about how biological tissue can be seen as technology, right? And now we are talking about how building more lifelike robots and how our body is kind of like an electrical system and cyborgs and stuff like that. So I think there will be a day where we will become indistinguishable in all aspects from these robots. So what are your thoughts on the social and cultural implications when this happens? The fusion of... Uh, uh, maybe, Michael, do, do you... Uh, does science fiction give okay. us clues about that moment? Well, I, I think for like cyborgs especially, they represent something that is, is coming, uh, already is here. So uh, culturally, it's something that we look at in terms of you know, whether it could be something progressive in terms of whether it's going to be a benefit, and if it's not a benefit, what is it then? So I, I think it's going to be hard for some people to accept uh, uh, cyborgs or robots in, in, in present days, just like any kind of form of technology. You have your early adopters, and then you also have people who are uh, skeptical about this technology in terms of what it can do or you know, and the fact that you mentioned it being indistinguishable is like, it's pretty frightening because you don't know whether you're talking to a human being or what kind of being are you describing. And it also brings a lot of social uh, justice implications also because it means like what happens if a robot goes astray and, uh, you know, decides to, uh, you know, uh, be harmful to humankind, you know, what are the ramifications of that as well. So these are things that topics that are discussed in, uh, in science fiction quite deliberately and I think consciously it's, it's looking at, uh, at recognizing, I think there was a, a movie called Bicentennial Man with Robin Williams and it was actually looking at whether a, a robot would be recognized as a human, you know, and he actually had to uh, go through this process to go to Congress or something like that to apply to be recognized as a human being because he was conscious and he was aging and uh, so these are the things that we're looking at and maybe it's not too far away, maybe it's, it's closer than we think. Thank you. Uh, oh, it's actually, I, th I think it's still quite far. Um, <laughs> the, thing, the thing is, like, if you cannot distinguish anymore, what's the problem? Um, and, and what's the name of the book again? History of Tomorrow, this book? A Brief History of Tomorrow that actually talks about that very specific question. And I think like as much as let's say if you go back in like 30, 40 years ago, only the very rich could afford open heart surgery, organ transplant and so forth. What it brings to society, like you know, now we talk about the one percenter and the rest of us. So soon there's gonna be the people who can afford genetic manipulation, they can afford the cyborg, the extra hand, whatever, name it. They will be part of a very, very rich, you know, all kinds of enhancement you can have in your body, and then there will be 
the rest of us stuck with the, you know, um, liver, fat liver, and things like this. <laughs> yes, there will be quite different machines. For example, Nadine is very realistic because since 30 years I'm working on virtual humans who are very realistic and also realistic robots, but it could be any shape. In fact, the software we put in Nadine could be put in this table. So if we have the software in this table, of course the table should have some hands and some facility, human facility to do things or eventually walk, bring things. It's just to give an example, with Internet of Things, any object could, be, could have the software. But I would say uh, there is a very big difference between we humans and robots. Even if robots look like us or mimic emotion or answer in a very intelligent way, in fact, they, are, they have no life. They have no pain, they have no sorrow, they have no death, they have no depression, and so on. And, and maybe the best of life, no joy. Nadine and all these robots feel nothing and we don't have to be afraid of them i mean we want since the antiquity and beyond uh, automaton and we know that today the slavery for example with children women and workers which do incredible dangerous work is more than one billion a year this is the united Nations report that shows these numbers so then we are happy to have robots to do all these tasks, no, not to have any more children working or people who are so much abused. But if we are a human, it's completely different because we feel, we feel life and we have a problem of human with death already, joy, uh, you know, motivation and so on. So even if we can simulate everything through programming and, you know, I'm a computer scientist, we can write a lot of programs, the program can learn also things, still there is no life. So that's a big difference between robots and ourselves forever. Unless, but this is maybe for my colleague next to me, science fiction. The science fiction is to have robots which are built with new generation of cells. Now, if you see downstairs, we build robots traditionally, I mean with 3D printing, which is already new, but Let's say we would start to take some generation of cell, having robots instead of cable and mortars, we use muscles. Then it starts to be a mix of biology and, uh, you know, mechanical parts. Then, but let's say I will leave my colleague next to me to, to eventually envisage this kind of future. But for now, as they are, I think is an enormous no comparison between we living person and these robots who are able to do be maybe better than us, but it's all simulated and calculated at the end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so let's, let's start here and then we'll go to that side. <coughs> Hi, thank you. We have been talking about uh, creating realistic social robots based on what we know about human beings. I want to reverse the direction and ask you this. In your efforts to create social robots, um, what have you discovered uh, or what sorts of insights you have gained about human beings? Um, in, in a very personal way, uh, in, uh, insights that, that cannot really be developed uh, otherwise in other conventional ways. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great question because really uh, it touched me at the heart. You know why? Because my life starts more and more I'm working with robots. I think before I was working on robotics because virtual human is a bit like uh, super, you know, fiction because it's in the virtual world so you never really touch them. But when you go to robots, when I moved 10 years ago to robots, then I started to see the entity, the physical one. And I was a bit in the imagination part because I worked so many years on virtual reality. But suddenly when you have the tangible robot, you exactly in your question, you start to make programs and you think you will give life. But what I discover when you ask me as the, maybe the main thing is I have received my body for free. It works in an automatic mode. 
I don't have to do anything, and it's a lot of things I don't understand, and I know how it functions, because as you say so nicely in your question, before we do anything for a robot, to do actions like we do, we have to understand our prop, proper mechanism and actions. So it's a lot of work in psychology, sociology, and in mechanics, and in AI, understanding how we function. And this is not an easy thing, you know that, in Europe, we have one uh, European project about one million euros, a billion euros, that means two billion Singapore dollars about modeling some kind of uh, brain in order to understand how it functions. I'm sure after five or 10 years, we won't have the solution, but at least we try to understand, but we are very complex and we know less that what we can imagine. In fact, we just try to understand what is a real human. And thanks to that, myself, I'm so happy with my life, more and more, because I think I have received a real gift. Thank you. Uh, a question over there. Okay, fine. Thank you for beautiful talks. Uh, I have a question about uh, how do you train the system, so Nadine system actually. So is it based on movies, so how you actually analyze the human reaction? And the second uh, question is uh, how did you build that movement system? It's amazing. So uh, actually, how, di how did you do it? I mean like based on what? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so for the question. You know, if you like to join the team, uh, please do. We need uh, you young guys to, because as I said, there's so much to discover. So you know, is in fact, for example, for the emotion, uh, you know, we, we could only model the emotion or write programs when psychologists has defined in a quantitative way, what is personality? So when they say it, they have to put, uh, you know, a classification of person, you are neurotic, you are positive, uh, you are aggressive and so on, and put values behind. Because what you have to know, a computer can only work with equations. At the end of the day is calculation. So when these psychologists in the 80s have started to define themselves, and it's late 80s to define themselves quantitatively with numbers, what is a personality? How can we divide it? What are emotions? How can we divide them? What are the moods? Then we could define mathematical models and program them in order that when you tell Nadine, as you have seen in the interaction, you are bad, I hate you, then she interprets the language with negative, first, how you speak, second, the values of the words, which has a ponderation, and behind that, afterwards, it goes to emotion, and because it was negative, she will answer with the negative aspect. It's just a small example. And, and what, if, uh, what if there are new emotions that we, as human, don't have yet? Can, can you imagine a, a, a future where robots can have new kind of emotions that are non-human? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we can model Nadine with uh, all kind of different uh, attitude. I mean, as she is realistic, we expect from her that she behaves in a realistic way. But if someone is interested to a more abstract shape, why not? We could, it's room for every artistic expression or eventually new kind of expression, which are not human to be simulated, that's no problem. Myself, I just try to make a normal human which will take years and years, and not only me, all the communities, but it's room to invent all kind of shape and new expression. We don't need to go for realistic robot. Okay, let's see, first that one. So is it a rule-based model or is it more like a neural, bunch of neural networks? It's not a rule-based model because it was the first generation. My 
my robot in, in uh, Geneva was rule-based. So rule-based is you have a bit question answer. It's not the case. Actually, she has a, a database, knowledge-based database, and according to what she received with neural network, she is trying to find the right word and to answer and to compose an answer. So if you talk to Nadine, some people say, well, she's out of the box sometimes. But you know, it's complicated because she is in real time trying to make a composition of what you ask towards what she has available. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, uh, honor first and then we'll go to that side, yes. Um, Louis-Philippe, I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit more about this concept of intelligence that isn't brain-based, you know, kind of mind-based intelligence, but is disembodied intelligence. And maybe linked to that, um, this quite prof profound comment you made about the blind robot um, and the power of naming it. Mm -hmm. So it was calling it blind that gave this power, emotional power to it. Um, yeah, I would try to maybe answer in many different parts, J just to link with the rest. I, I think when we talk about models and things like this, is like when now, when we try to make a, a human as a robot, we it's a bit like going shopping. I'm gonna put the brain. I'm gonna put the eyes. Uh, it doesn't work like this. You cannot assemble thing and think you're gonna get something at the end. So. The thing, the difference with what we do now with, let's say, the mechanistic model or the cybernetic model, we assemble things. Nature grows. That's a very different approach. And the thing is, you are the result of, let's say, in my case, uh, 50 plus years of constant simulation input, constant thinking, digestion, cell regeneration. So this is everything. So to link with the brain, when I think about something, when I think about a concept, is not only an abstract concept, it's re-triggering body states, the way I was standing when I was doing it. So it's immensely more complex than saying like this is this and that and so forth. So what happened is like now the more they go, like they discovered, let's say, a kind of intelligence, might be a, a wrong word, but like elements of nature or materials, they, they have a behavior, they have, let's say, a processing power. They can, as much like, you know, organism can do and so forth. So they, they have a sense of like, let's say, self-balancing. They, they can do a lot of things. So it can be really distributed into the thing. So if we extend it, like for instance, like people say, like if I go to eyes, for instance, some people will claim that the muscle in your neck are part of your vision system. Because when I go like this, I can still focus. So this is all embedded. So it's way more complex. And if I have a bit, you know, a neck pain, then I have to go like this, move my body, and so forth. Then it can retrigger other memories. So it's it's so much richer. So this is like where it gets interesting. And when we start to decentralize the brain, of course, to go back to the decap model, saying like, uh, okay, this is the brain and this is the body. Now, these days, nobody thinks about, I mean, it's getting merged together. And actually, there are things that, instead of modeling it, you just build it. Let's say the, um, the, the little stumpies, they self-balance because the, the way I use the rubbers, and if I change the rubber, they will fall down. And it's, it's, I don't program it, it's just it's construction-based. Is it intelligence? I think yes. I mean, it's part of the, the whole construction. The way, because intelligence is the way you interact with your environment as well. This is, and, and your competence is based on your environment. Fish are intelligent in water, but they're very bad on the ground, and vice versa for us. So uh, there is an intelligence there, like in terms of your, your expertise. So what happened is like, when they started from, the AI model of, say, let's say, let's play chess, you know, like, this is not, it's, it's a scientific problem, mathematical problem to solve, but in a day-to-day -day thing, it's not supremely important. It gives you some insight about permutation and so forth, but doesn't do anything much further. Um, so, 
to have competence of a robot. I mean, like, le let's say machine and stuff, their competence has to be way different than being brain power to evolve in, in our environment. So they, it has to become the decentralized. So they, they realize that, uh, let's say, and a, a big breakthrough that happened as well through Ronnie Brooks at MIT, a researcher, uh, he made a seminal paper called Intelligence Without Representation. So that really shook the ground because people say it needs a model. But then he, he was saying, well, no, that doesn't need a model. Like when I grab this thing, I don't have a database of all the glasses in my brain. I just grab it and I can even don't look at it because the intelligence is in the grasping. There's enough self-intelligence in there so the competence gets highly, highly distributed and then what will happen with the human plus then, this is <laughs> that's another part, like see how we can expand it. But again, if you just put it on top without experiencing for a long time, I think that's very, very different. So I think the day when there's going to be a robot that's going to be online for you know, 20 years, that's going to be very, very different than the thing we run the time of a demo to grab information. Thank you. Uh, yes, here on the first. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it's been very informative to even me as a very uh, a lay person. Okay, but uh, one thing that I'm curious about, and I think you've touched on this a little, uh, robotics as a general field can't really progress without developments in other fields such as psychology, sociology, especially if you want your robots to do certain things in those certain areas. So uh, you also mentioned about, you know, uh, thinking about intelligence. So, um, what are some of the? My question is, what are some of the less obvious fields of, you know, research or study that you are kind of maybe keeping an eye on or you're excited about, and uh, because you know they can, you know, maybe help you or maybe they have huge implications that we ourselves who are not in robotics, so you know, might miss. Yeah. So that's my question. Yes, for example, in the memory, you know, when uh, Nadine, we have developed memory models, computational memory problem. And of course, when I talk to her, because I was introduced, she knows me, she keeps facts in her memory. But what disturbs me is when people uh, come, or even myself with others, and you ask what is my hobby or what is this, she starts to explain all what she knows. And you know, when you say what is diff difficult, for example, how we in society are saying things but are not saying other things. How do we filter all the time in interaction? And this, as long as there is no social model to make a computational model, we cannot do it. It's just an example that Nadine behaves like a very small child who will say all what she knows. But how do we filter? Who knows? And things which are difficult is instinct or this kind of good sense. What is it? I mean, what we can include in robot is all the logical part. It's absolutely not complex. I mean, the more we go, the more robot will perform in many tasks better than we do in terms of logical parts. But all what it is, appreciation, value, instinct, good sense, uh, you know, respecting the, the social rules, how do we react in the proper way, politically correct, these are quite open challenges that nobody knows how to solve them. Um, for you, Louis Philippe, are there frontier fields that you're looking at? Um, I, I think everything. <laughs> um, but I would say mostly like it's biological, like nature, things like this, things how they interact. Because, um, you know, I st let's say I started from a modeling base because I was doing my PhD in computer science and I got really uh, shy away from all these things because you know I'm lazy and I don't want to program everything so I want things to happen on their own so uh, so this is why I'm more interested in what they call natural computing 
So you, you don't make a computer, you actually build it and you measure it and things like this. So this is why I'm interested in robots that I don't program the behavior. I, I give a name, I give a context. I mean, of course, there's a bit of movement, but there, there's no big scheme in the thing. And then after the way they are built, this is how they behave. So the, the programming is made by building like they used to do like uh, all the time with kinetics culture and structure. Yeah. I have actually a slightly related question for, for Michael. I noticed that all of your five top uh, cyborgs, they, there have been several releases and you know, re, re, um, yes, of the, of the movies. Um, is there a trend there where the cyborgs are updated and, and follow indeed the developments of science and technology or, um, or, or it depends? I think for me, it's like what I find fascinating is that these are like characters that existed when I was younger. I won't say how old I am, but uh, <laughs> it's, and, and to see them come back means I think in, in terms of popular culture is that you establish something iconic and there's a demand again for, for seeing, uh, revisiting that because there's a new audience also. So these are like reincarnations or something that's very familiar and it's proven to be, you know, the studios are mainly about box office, so they recash all these characters again because they, they've seen them make money, so they generate more and more of these films. So you can see lots of examples of that happening right now in, in what's in showing in the cinemas, like Alien and so example. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's like Star Wars. I mean, that was when I was a little kid. It's like, you know, and it's still showing today. It's like, it's still very much part of the folklore. And I think it, it goes back to the whole idea of myths and storytelling that, that fascinates humankind for a long time. And, and, and these kind of characters kind of like, you know, they have a lot of longevity in that sense. So, um, well, what about the robot in Interstellar, Stars? That, that's a robot. Very, very uh, non-anthropomorphic, but you know, or the road, the the machine in two thousand one. So like the, these yeah, are like yeah. so so different. Yeah, I mean there are different forms of robots and and AI. I mean when you look at it, it's like it's. I think a lot of it has to do with consciousness. It's like the idea of artificial intelligence, and then what is the physical construct in terms of what that f consciousness occupies? Whether it's something that's humanoid form or whether it's operating a starship, uh, like an alien or in 2001. Uh, there are certain amounts of computational tasks that it's impossible for a human being to do, and you need these kinds of technologies or AI to run these ships because it would be impossible to like, have like 2,000 people on a spaceship kind of like operating all the different components necessary to run it. So you have to have a certain degree of automation as well. So, uh, you know, I think it, it's, it's a question of whether you're looking at it from a human perspective or something that's replacing human beings, or is it the next step in terms of the evolution of where human beings can go in terms of space, you know, whether it's outer space, uh, whether it's actually robots that are gonna go to Mars and beyond or something like that, just not just humans, because we're just ultimately a, a shell, a physical shell, so we have our limitations. We need oxygen, we need water, we need sustenance, whereas a, a robotic, uh, being doesn't need all that sort of uh, baggage, <laughs> you know, in, in a way. Yes. It needs batteries, but maybe yeah. they can invent something that can regenerate itself, you know, through solar or something, I don't know. Yeah. No, thank you. We have time for maybe one, one whoa, 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 okay. Uh, that was the first one I saw, uh, so let's. <coughs> um, so, um, I think it's very interesting, right? When uh, today, it seems to me that when we think of robots, we usually think of either servants, meaning that they will do the kind of jobs that, we, that are either dangerous for us or we don't really want to do anymore, or at most companions, like they can take care of you know, elder people or lonely people. But can you maybe imagine a future where robots and machines will actually replace, for example, politicians? They will be... <laughs> They will, be the, they will actually be the beings that rule us. So we choose robots to take care of the big decision-making processes simply because we are you know, biased and we are not very good at it. Are you talking about somebody to replace Donald Trump? <laughs> for, example, <laughs> for example, this is actually the first time I thought about it. Is, it was when he won. Um, actually, it was, uh, in science fiction, it was quite a recurrent theme. 
uh, especially in the 60s, to have robots as ruler of the world, like Colossus is an example. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard made Alphaville. Um, there's, there's a lot of examples where they, they take over, or like even Robocop is among, among that line. Um, I, I, think, I, I think to make a robot that will replace the human is, I, I think it's besides the point. We're reproducing yeah. quite well. <laughs> I, I think I think a robot should be a robot. I mean, I mean, there's a difference to, between a self-driving car and, a, and another human. It's it's a big big difference, you know. Uh, it's much more functional or something. When when it gets to another level, um, a lot of time I go like, why why bother? 